Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today we're going to be talking about how dictionaries get made. But first, bonus episodes! We have them. We now have bonus episodes about how to teach yourself even more linguistics with our top recommendations for books, videos, and further resources for self-study. And we also have a bonus episode about swearing. And this month's bonus on Patreon is about how to sell your awesome linguistic skills to employers. So you can check out the Patreon at www.patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or just follow the link on lingthusiasm.com to see those bonus episodes, support the show, and help make lingthusiasm keep growing. Today we are talking dictionaries, which is a super exciting genre of book for linguists to be interested in. And this is for a number of reasons. The first of which is Corey Stamper's new book, Word by Word, came out a couple of months ago and we both read it and we had the best fun reading it. And we wanted to talk about it so much that we ended up just talking about it for this whole episode. The whole episode will kind of be framed around Corey's book and some of the things that we really enjoyed about reading it. But that is not the only reason, is it, Gretchen? Yeah, and we're also also going to be talking about other stuff to do with dictionaries because I was recently on a panel about dictionaries at South by Southwest and I also got to meet Corey and hang out with some other dictionary people when she gave a talk in New York City. I happened to be going down on that specific day. And so this episode will be another episode in the genre of Gretchen makes Lauren really jealous by telling her about all the cool linguist and lexicography peeps that she got to hang out with. You just need to come here and come to a conference and then I can introduce you to everybody and it'll be great. Yeah, but and for now, we're all going to live vicariously through Gretchen's excellent adventures. Okay, so I got to have drinks with, like, this is a great group of people, because I messaged Corey, and I was like, hey, let's meet up. And she was like, but only if you can come to drinks with these other amazing people. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I can handle that. Oh, tough. So tough. So I get to have drinks with Ben Zimmer, who we've mentioned many times in this podcast, um, who I already knew, and uh, does the the word column for Wall Street Journal, and Jesse Scheidlauer, who does the word column for New Yorker, and Catherine Connor Martin, who is the head of U.S. Dictionaries for the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, and she was very cool. And also the like stealth excited person to be on this uh, list uh, was Lauren Natural, who runs the Merriam-Webster Twitter account. That is so exciting. I mean, another excellent Lauren. Another excellent Lauren. All Lauren are excellent. And so in case you're not on Twitter and haven't noticed the Merriam-Webster Twitter account, it has been waking waves a lot recently for doing some really cool and funny and topical tweets. I was gonna say it's very on topic. It's very on topic. It's very like on the nose. If something happens in the news, they will call it that kind of thing. Or if something happens in politics, they'll like they'll call that out. So they've been really, really, really trenchant these days. And so I was very excited about that. I was excited about the other people too, but I was like, um, Lauren is their Twitter account, to give you an idea of just how popular it is, has won a Webby Award. They've won three Webby Awards at Merriam Webster, which are kind of an indication that they have appealed beyond people who may have traditionally been fans of lexicography and dictionaries. I think my favourite Merriam-Webster tweet, and this is kind of a classic one, this was like the first one I noticed when they were really being topical and being kind of sassy, is when they tweeted, people keep, number one, saying know what genderqueer means, then, number two, asking us why we added it to the dictionary. (laughs) Um, I always like their very on-topic word of the days, which often kind of just allude to something that is in the media or kind of on topic. Um, Yeah, like when people were talking about alternative facts, they tweeted a definition of facts, not fact machines, F-A-C-T-S. So yeah, there are some great Merriam-Webster tweets. uh, And I think they're a fun example of like cool things you can do with the dictionary as an authority and yet trying to break down some of the ways that dictionaries are seen as very static and fussy and try to bring them into the 21st century. And I think that's part of the appeal of Well, what I found Corey's book so appealing. Word by Word is a kind of insider's look at how a dictionary gets made. She's been an editor at Merriam-Webster for... 15 years or so and it kind of takes you through the the machinations of how dictionaries get made uh, a kind of an unglamorous sausage factory approach to that process 
but it was really cool because you can, I, I thought I was really able to picture it. And now I feel like, you know, if I went there, hopefully someday, maybe I'll go there to the, the Merriam-Webster office in Springfield, Massachusetts. And she's describing like the old school filing cabinets and like drawers and drawers and shelves and boxes of citations. So if you're going to find examples for words, they read all these magazines and newspapers and all of this stuff to find words that people are using differently that aren't in the dictionary yet or that should be updated. You know, people bring in like cereal boxes and take photos of signs while they're on vacation and use them as examples and stuff as well. And just like figuring out how all of this stuff works was really fun. And you got to talk to a whole panel of people who make dictionaries as part of the South by Southwest talk that you went and did a couple of months ago now? It was in March. Yeah. And so I did a panel with Aaron McKean of Wordnik, uh, Jane Solomon of Dictionary.com and Ben Zimmer, who I've already mentioned, who I saw a lot in March. So we did a panel about dictionaries tech in the future at South by Southwest. And we talked about things like, you know, how do you construct a dictionary? How do you decide what to let into the dictionary? So Aaron's approach with Wordnik, which, you know, kind of re imagines the dictionary from the tradition of the paper dictionary, which is very limited to like how many pages you can have in that. Aaron's approach with Wordnik is if someone has searched for it, we'll give you a page that has whatever information we have. And if no one has searched for it before and no one has added anything to that page, there's nothing on it. But for some words, there there is stuff on it. You know, so I asked them like, is there any thought of adding emoji to the dictionary? The face with tears of joy emoji was Oxford's word of the year 2015, I think. I asked them, you know, are you going to add emoji? And Aaron said, well, you can search for emoji in Wordnik. For a lot of them, you might not find very much information, but you can search for them. You know, they've got this kind of crowdsourced approach to adding stuff about particular words in addition to the base dictionary that they started with. So people can add information about those. Dictionaries are an interesting state of flux at the moment. I think it's fair to say like very few people are buying or interacting with paper dictionaries. More and more people are using online resources exclusively. And also dictionary makers are moving from using like reading written things to add to the dictionary and searching online corpora instead. So that leads to some interesting ways in which dictionaries will change. And people who are using dictionaries themselves, not just dictionary makers that are using electronic sources, but people who are searching for words in a dictionary rather than opening up, a, you know, I have a bunch of dictionaries on my shelf. I'm looking over and seeing them right now. I have dictionaries for several languages on my shelf. But when was the last time I pulled one off and opened it and used it for something? Like, it's not very often because I'm like, well, I'm already at my computer. Yeah. I can just, you know, I can just search for the word there. Which I think is really great in terms of usability and accessibility. I think it kind of makes us feel like the dictionary, you know, it's the same problem that journalism and a lot of other industries have as well, is we feel like we're entitled to dictionaries even more than we have ever felt mm -hmm. throughout history. And I think that was, again, one thing I really loved about Word by Word is the book kind of shows you that, like, it's a massive labor to write a dictionary and to keep it up to date. And this is real work that has to be done by real humans. Computers aren't actually that good at doing Doing that work. Yeah, we have this perception that there's a the dictionary and I trolled my panel because I was moderating them and I said, okay, which one of you is the dictionary? Like, do we have a fight here? Oh, did you find out which one is the dictionary? <laughs> they all claimed it. It was very disappointing. <laughs> We have a perception that dictionary is like a faceless thing that doesn't even have like a brand name in some cases and that all of them are essentially equivalent to each other and it doesn't matter if you're using a 50 year old one, maybe it's better, even though it's going to not have words from the past 50 years and so on. And one of the things I liked about Corey's book is the way she talked about this construction of authority in terms of, you know, dictionaries constructed that authority for themselves. Like people didn't come out of nowhere with this idea that the dictionary was a thing you should look to for all your answers. That was in early dictionary ad campaigns. You know, Merriam-Webster and, and someone were using this to sell dictionary to say, this is where you should get all your information. Like they have this ask the editor feature you can like write in and get answers on anything. And that was like a big selling feature. And Corey tweets about some of the funny things people ask her. Corey has an excellent blog. I really hoped this book would be as excellent as the blog Harmless Drudgery. We'll put that in the show notes. She certainly has a good approach to dealing with people's ways of engaging with dictionaries. Yeah, she's got a really funny voice. She's got a great sense of humor and the book was fun. And I was basically positive I was going to like it because I liked her blog and, and Twitter so much. Yeah, sorry. You thought this was a review episode. It's actually just a fangirl episode. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's one of those things where you try to do a balanced review and you're like, oh, these were the pros and cons. And like, there, yeah. there weren't any cons. The book did exactly what it should do. And it, what it did was great. Yeah. So <laughs> that was good. 
So, yeah, they have this idea of authority. And, you know, I personally just thought of dictionaries as dictionaries and I used whichever one my school gave me. Yeah. I think the social media presence of dictionaries is actually helping me feel like they have personalities. Yeah. I think I thought of dictionaries as kind of like the periodic table. Yeah. You know, like everyone's just gotten this consensus or like, or like the phone book. You know, like the phone book just is. It's not like someone had to sit down and decide. I guess someone did decide who got each number, but that's not something that's very transparent to you when you use the phone book. Yeah. Um, They're both good to, you know, if you have a child and they need to be propped up on a seat, you can give them a nice thick dictionary or phone book sit on. (laughs) So that's useful. They have multiple functions. I feel like like there's a whole bunch of dictionary makers that are like very sad at you right now for that. (laughs) No, they sell copies. Are you kidding me? (laughs) <laughs> They're all trying to like increase their print sales of the unabridged version. I mean, I, I I didn't really ever have respect fully for lexicographers until I had to make a dictionary as part of my work on Lam Jung Yolmo, which is a Tibetan language that I worked on for my PhD. People get really upset in like grant proposals and proper linguistic stuff when I talk about it being a dictionary because it is technically a bilingual word list of translations. Well, um. <laughs> But the thing is, the speakers of the language refer to it as a dictionary. It's as close to a dictionary as anyone is going to write for that language anytime soon. So you weren't defining the words in YOLO? Yeah, a dictionary should technically be the word and then its definition using that language to define it. I mean, I have a French English dictionary and a German English dictionary and they still call themselves dictionaries. No, they would be translation wordless. Well, you tell that to La Rousse. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to be honest, it is not like the forefront of my skill set. And there are definitely like eight different entries that just translate as green leafy edible vegetable. <laughs> so that gave me a level of like respect for lexicography I didn't have before. Yeah. So when you're writing a dictionary from scratch, like how do you go about doing that? Do you just like start writing down words, you know, or do you go systematically? Do you go in alphabetical order? Like how do you make that? Uh, in terms of the one that I made. Yeah, because like Corey's book, she's talking about like they go through the alphabet, but a lot of what they're doing is they're revising the definitions that already exist because English has like a several hundred year tradition of dictionary making. And so dictionaries don't start from scratch anymore. They start from the previous edition or from some previous thing and they revise it and they update it. And so they have this kind of entrenched bureaucracy there already. But I imagine if you're creating a dictionary or word list from scratch, like where do you go from there? The thing we made was definitely more ad hoc and opportunistic. If you document a language, there are kind of some word lists that people encourage you to use to kind of get the basic vocabulary. And then a lot of it came from stories and other texts that we collected. And some of them just came from, you know, they make a lot of bamboo baskets. So one day I just sat there with one of the women and she was making a basket. I was like, what's that called? What's Mm -hmm. that called? And I think it was probably like the most irritating day of work she has ever had. But now this basket vocabulary is documented. Yep. I mean, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not comprehensive. I think a lot of, especially English dictionaries, kind of try and sell themselves on their comprehensiveness. This is much more a kind of opportunistic output of what was done within the documentation. And so then if someone was trying to make a more comprehensive dictionary, they could use that as a starting point and then yeah. get some more and kind of keep building on that. Yeah, I've heard of people doing things where you get a get a couple speakers and you sit down and say, okay, today we're going to talk about body parts or today we're going to talk about like family terms. I also um, participated in, I'll add a link to this as well. One time I was in Nepal, I spent a week watching mm. a rapid words workshop, dictionary workshop happen, which is where they got 40 speakers of Shuba, which is the language I work with at the moment. They brought them all to a single place together for two weeks there's this very, very elaborate semantic set that gets used and they were given all these worksheets and it was like, right, today, name all the words in relation to house building. Name all the words in relation to women's clothing. So they have like hundreds of semantic prompts. And these are things that like most languages have some words around? Yeah. Sometimes they're big, like name all of the astrological phenomena in the sky. Right. And sometimes they're really much more specific. And I guess it might depend, you know, if you have a language that's only spoken in a landlocked region, they probably won't have a lot of words to do with, like, the ocean. Yeah. And so they ended up pulling together about 20,000 words, some of which were, like, overlaps. But, yeah, within two weeks, they built the guts of a dictionary. It was a very efficient machine. Wow. And then so someone has to go through and collate all those worksheets and, like, put them together and compare, like, all the words that everybody wrote down. 
they had a pool of people typing it up. It was a kind of factory dictionary building in a really cool way. Wow, that's really interesting. I wrote an article about that and I'll link to it in the show notes. So like that was like for those two examples, the words that get in are just all of the words. You know, we're kind of starting from scratch. We're literally adding words like cat and dog and person and really basic vocabulary. And you might have a harder time with even grammatical words or something like that because they're like, you know, list all the function words in your language or like list all of the prepositions in your language. I guess you could probably do prepositions. Yeah. Thinking of like, you know, list all of the the particles or something would be harder. You'd, You'd want to do a grammatical description for that. I mean, one thing you get a sense of from Corey's book is that people who are trained to do lexicography and dictionary editing have a very finely tuned sense of language. Mm -hmm. And this is not what was happening. This was very basic word collection. But dictionary writers and people who are figuring out definitions have to kind of have a very finely tuned sense of the slight differences between very similar words or different senses of a single word. Yeah, I think the example Corey had was measly. Like measly is a small amount, but it's also kind of small and mean. It's not a good small. Yeah. So having those little bits, she calls it spackefel, the German word for like the feeling of a language. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I liked that. So Corey walked us through the sense of how she and Emily Brewster had a new sense of the word ah, uh, as in a, an apple. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, as, uh, uh, as in a banana. <laughs> right. Um, and, uh, you know, you think you know approximately what this word does. And the, yeah, they noticed there was another sense that it was doing. And Emily figured out exactly how to describe and characterize this particular sense that hadn't been described. So if you're doing very, like, initial dictionary building for a language that doesn't have one, you may not be trying to catalog all of the possible senses for every single word. You're saying we need to kind of get down a word list as much as possible, and then we can work on refining it more later. There's a lot of different stages. Yeah, but dictionaries at some point become big enough that they have to kind of start deciding, especially for a language like English, where there are so many speakers in so many parts of the world and English is used in so many domains, like it's a language of day-to-day -day chat for people, it's a language of law, it's a language of science. It has a lot of domains in which it operates and so it has a lot of vocabulary that may not be in other languages, but that needs to be defined. Yeah, and but which you might not want to have in a standard dictionary. You might not want to have every name of every possible chemical compound in a small hand-sized dictionary. Yeah, and like some words that may have like not been updated for a long time suddenly become very topical. Mm -hmm. It suddenly needs some attention. There's a really nice quote from Sue Butler. Back in 2012 in Australia, the word misogyny suddenly became very uh, topical because we had a female prime minister who was trying to call out some misogynistic behaviour. She gave that great speech in Parliament. It was good. She did. And uh, Sue had a very busy week because that was something that people were looking up a lot. And she said, I always think of myself as the person with a mop and broom and a bucket coming in and cleaning up after the party's over. In this case, it was a fairly big party and what was left on the floor was misogyny. So sometimes a word will become popular again and a dictionary hasn't really touched their definition for a while mm -hmm. um, or they're suddenly lexicographers are being called on to kind of talk about these topics and that might kind of a word that had been neglected and not in a abridged dictionary is suddenly an important and useful word again yeah or like a politician will use an obscure word in a in a speech or a debate or something and everyone will say i kind of know what that means but i'm not quite sure let me go look that up and then oh we haven't touched the definition in 50 years i do like merriam webster will talk about which words are trending in terms of they haven't been looked up for a while and suddenly people are and it is often related to something that is happening yeah, several of the dictionaries do that. It's great. Yeah, and it's one of the nice things about these new online dictionaries and that they're using this data of who's interacting and how they're interacting with the dictionary. I find it so fascinating. I think it's also interesting because, you know, when we made paper books and sent them to people, you had no idea what people are looking at. Mm -hmm some of the earlier earliest English dictionaries were like a table of hard words. So they wouldn't even include the basic words because they're like, well, everybody knows, you know, what love is or what a mother is or something like that. We don't need to put that in. We're going to put, you know, indefatigable or something like that in our dictionaries because people look that up. It's hard. Yeah. Indefatigable? I don't know. And... <laughs> You should look it up in the dictionary to see how it's pronounced. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But what they found is that when you put them online, you can use stats and you, you, have, you have visitor stats now. And a lot of people do look up words like love and mother or they want to express their feelings. Aww. 
you know, kind of like you go to kind of like you go to the the drugstore and you look through like all the cards and try to find something that really sums up what you want to say about your feelings for your mother. Sometimes people go to the dictionary for that. You are a good female parent. Or on Valentine's Day, they look up what love is because they want the dictionary to put that into words for them, which I don't think the lexicographers are really like they're They don't think of themselves as like greeting card writers. They're just trying to describe how people are already using the word rather than give you a nice pithy thing to put in your greeting cards. I mean, that's probably a very obvious point that we maybe just need to make very explicit and that dictionary makers are still trying to make explicit after years of claiming themselves to be the authority. But a dictionary is being descriptive. It's describing how people are using language commonly at the time that the dictionary is published. They're not trying to tell you how a word has to be used. I think there is a history of dictionaries that did try to tell people how to use words, though. Like, they, they came by that reputation, honestly. It's just that they have now disavowed mm. that because they've realized that it's kind of a jerk thing to do. Yeah. One way that some dictionaries do this, and the Oxford English Dictionary on historical principles is the most famous and probably the most comprehensive yeah. in English, is by using historical quotes to provide supporting evidence for their definition and the change in a word's meaning over time. Yeah. Which is something that I take for granted, but I use all the time. It is like mm -hmm. such a useful feature of dictionaries. And Oxford lists its definitions in order of which ones came first, whereas most other dictionaries list their definitions in order of which one's most common. If you go to a, the definition and you see the first yeah. meaning, you're like, that's not what I, how I would use this word. It's like, no, that's not how you use it now. But that's how people used it, you know, 50 years ago or 300 years ago or something like that. I'm always surprised. Like, words are always older than I think they are. And this recency illusion is something people talk about a lot. And we all think that like language has changed when we see it having been different. But I have a surprisingly large number of posts on Superlinguo where it's like, oh, turns out G-strings are older <laughs> than I thought. Turns out the word hipster, much older than I thought. And I really, I really love that feature. How old are G-strings, Lauren? The oldest citation for G-string that the OED has. Do you want to have a guess? Um, 1920s? Earlier. Oh, um, I was thinking the Roaring Twenties. I'll give you a clue. The entry for G-String hasn't been updated since 1933. Oh, God. Uh, Which is like when it was published, probably. It's like 1850s? Yep, uh, 1878. So within that window. Okay, okay. It was first used G-String, G-E-E, -E, String, as a description of the loincloths of Native Americans of India is the first oh. written citation that we have. I'll link to that in the show notes. So it wasn't initially like dancers and stuff. No, I first came across it because I was reading The Talented Mr. Ripley, which was published in 1955. And I was like, oh, that's much earlier than I hmm. thought. And it's even earlier than that. Oh, yeah. I think of it as being like a, you know, whenever pole dancing became popular, kind of around that period. Nope. Older than that. And people have this sport of trying to find older to antedate the earliest reference. Ag again, like, warning, it's always the earliest written reference that we have. Right. Especially for, like, slangy or informal words, people were probably saying them long before they were written down, especially anything pre, kind of, the modern era, I guess. Victorian era? Victoria, you see a lot of stuff is, like, letters from that era. Yeah, letters and newspapers and ad campaigns. Like, yeah. advertisers tend to be trying to pick up on modern slang, and newspapers sometimes are closer to slang, and they have a much shorter production time than a book. Yeah. Depending on the newspaper, I mean, the New Yorker is still writing cooperative with a, you know, diaries diaresis over the O. Two dots. <laughs> Just because, like, they want to be those people. While we're talking about the OED's historical quotes probably a good time to shout out to another book that is worth reading on kind of dictionary making. This is a piece of pseudo fiction, if I'm not mistaken. I haven't actually read it, but I've been hearing about it for a while and maybe now I'm... I, I read it and now I just feel like I can't remember if it was fiction or not, but it was very compelling. It's The Surgeon of Crowthorn. It's based on a true story, but I think it may have some poetic yeah. license taken. I have heard of it as The Professor and the Mad Men, uh, which I guess it was retitled for the, the North American audience. Yeah, it has two different names. They're also making it into a movie now with Mel Gibson, so depending on how much you like Mel Gibson. <laughs> the book is by Simon Winchester, who also wrote a non fiction account of the early years of the Oxford English Dictionary and um, okay. I'm intrigued I mean it's really great that we're going to have a Hollywood film about the OED so stay tuned we can add it to the list of linguist movies with Arrival and My Fair Lady and that that's it yeah three <laughs> woo three but like two of them in the past couple of years that's that's very exciting 
that becomes technically a movie marathon. So that is <laughs> that is a Good. fabulous development. So that's a thing that also exists with dictionaries. And there's also other national dictionaries. So there's a like dictionary of Canadianisms on historical principles, and there's Canadian versions of the OED and stuff. The Dictionary of Canadianisms on Historical Principles has uh, recently done an update, and they have a very extensive, I think it's about 3,000 words on A and how it's used in Canada. Awesome. So that was great. I really enjoyed that. Uh, and they also have various other Canadian regionalisms, which took me back to the day when I took a Canadian English course once in undergrad. And I'm going to give my local shout out to the Australian National Dictionary Centre, who are affiliated with the OED and work specifically on Australian lexical terms. The first edition of that dictionary is available for free online. Mm. Super useful. They have a second edition that's just come out very recently. And of course, the Macquarie Dictionary is Australia's dictionary as well. And um, as someone who's often asked about Australian words and whether they really are Australian, both of those are invaluable to me. I recently quoted you as my source on Australian English because I did an interview <laughs> with NPR. I am your Australian. Uh, you're my official Australian. I'm my go-to Australian. You are my go-to Canadian. Okay, good, so. good. We're, we're, we're equal. I do sometimes get a bit nostalgic for my print dictionaries, none of which made the move with me to the UK. They're all languishing in a box for the moment. But I, there's something really nice about like rifling through a dictionary and the kind of you kind of stumble upon something that's like related to it, but not quite what you were looking for. But I do also remember just the pain of learning to search alphabetically as a child. Like I just have memories of primary school and like the minutes that it would take you to look up a word in the dictionary. And that's a very specific skill that you had to learn. Yeah, like you had to be taught that. I remember being taught how to alphabetize and how to go like alphabetically by each letter. And not all languages alphabetize as easily as English does. You know, well, not all languages have alphabets, so they don't all alphabetize as easily. So you can memorize like radical order if you want to look stuff up in a paper dictionary in Chinese. You have to look, know what the first radical is in this particular word. And if you want to look up a word based on hearing it, it's kind of hard to do that if you're using a paper dictionary because you don't know what the radicals are going to be. I have never had to look up a sign language print dictionary, but I believe that they, at least some of the ones that I know of, worked on the English kind of gloss or translation word that was the basis of the equivalent for the sign. So you had to kind of know English to be able to look up an Auslan uh, Australian Sign Language sign. Which is not great if your first language is actually Auslan or ASL. or. But also that's how modern, so on, I've, I've only ever looked up online sign dictionaries and Auslan has an amazing one, which is the Auslan Sign Bank. There's also a British Sign Language one and I think they're building one for American Sign Language at the moment. I'll put the links to those in the show notes. But one of the great things that have happened with sign language dictionaries in the online spaces they can have videos and gifs and pictures <laughs> it's so good rather than just line diagrams of how to make this sign or descriptions of it yeah you're trying to follow a static image and you're like does that arrow mean that the whole hand moves or just the arm or so the the videos are a real boon for sign dictionaries and multimedia in general because Corey Stamper has this blog post which I think is going to be related to the topic of her next book about how dictionaries go about defining color terms which if you you need to do it in a kind of black and white dictionary in text and say like this is what this shade of red is you know that's actually, actually quite, hard. quite hard we have a whole color episode and go listen yeah. to about defining color and the challenge is there and i think that's also um something that's important to mention is that the way words work in dictionaries is not necessarily how they work in your brain mm -hmm. I mean, dictionaries have an important function and we use them to come to an understanding of the meaning of words, but it's not necessary there's a one-to-one -one equivalence between a dictionary and your brain, thankfully, because I could not sit here rifling through my brain in alphabetical order. Um, it would take me five minutes to say any word. <laughs> your brain probably doesn't have an alphabetical order. The alphabet is an arbitrary order that's just historical. My brain probably doesn't. It possibly has some amount of cognitive organisation that now occurs alphabetically because of the way English was imposed in my education system, but definitely not as a kind of primary structure in the way it is in a dictionary. Yeah, one of the analogies I like to use is that language is open source and dictionaries are one kind of help documentation. Oh, that's nice. And so if you think about an open source project, you know, you have different people contributing to it and stuff lives or dies based on whether other people take it up. And it's something that every speaker of a language is contributing to that language's open source project. And it's useful to have help documentation, but help documentation often lags behind new features. Yeah. You know, like it still says that this menu is over here, but actually that's not true anymore because in version seven, we've, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we changed things. We consolidated the menus. 
Yeah. Uh, dictionaries are supposed to be help documentation for a language. They're not the language itself. They're not a replacement for the language itself. You know, the speakers of Yolmo, even though their dictionary is not as complete as the speakers of English, they still can talk. They still have all the words and they can add more words. Yeah, they still have more words than that. Like their language is as complex as English, even if their dictionary technology hasn't, their help documentation isn't as, as comprehensive. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. And I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. To listen to bonus episodes, ask us your linguistics questions, and help keep the show ad-free and sustainable, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Bonus episodes that you can listen to right now as soon as you pledge include one about swearing, another about how to teach yourself linguistics, another about explaining linguistics. If you can't afford to pledge, it really helps the show reach new lists if you can rate us on iTunes or recommend us on social networks or to people in person. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our producer is Claire, and our music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!